coordinator here at the Reserve. This talk is part of a year-long lecture series. Um, it's funded in part by the Kikfu Reforestation Fund, also known as the Newsom Grant. And then also the Friends of the KBR help out and also the Reserve helps pay the, some of the costs as well. So tonight we have uh, Professor Eric Anderson. He's a wildlife and wildlife ecology professor at UW Stevens Point. He is here to talk to us about bobcat and cougar populations in the state. And we did have Eric here five years ago. Some of you I know were here. So he's here to give us an update on uh, what he told us back then. So I do need to keep track of attendance, so I appreciate it. you guys could pass this around to the side. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'm really excited to be here and actually more excited by the number of you that are here and interested in hearing about this stuff. Um, I've been doing research on carnivores in the state for a number of years now and um, I started out working with bobcats, had an opportunity to delve into the world of cougars for a while, spent an entire year uh, in 2010, 2011 chasing mountain lions in New Mexico. So I've had a chance to expand my horizons on a little bit. What I'd like to do with you tonight is to take you through where we are currently in our understanding of bobcats and then talk about what we see in the state right now in terms of mountain lions and then hopefully give you an idea of what we might expect to see out there in the future. What I will need you to do for me is if you have any trouble at all hearing me, just kind of wave from the back of the room if it's getting difficult to hear or understand. I also apologize to start out with, I am a wanderer when I speak. So you may see me going back and forth and it's just to make sure that you're awake because I can see your eyes moving. I know that you're still with me and still conscious. So with that, uh, I'd like to go ahead and actually start out by posing you a question for just one minute. Um, I want to see if you guys can make a connection between mountain lions and butterflies, an increase in butterflies with the presence of mountain lions, an increase in amphibians when there are mountain lions in the area, an increase in fish diversity when there are mountain lions in the area, and an increase in lizards when there is a mountain lion population in the area. By the end of tonight, hopefully you'll understand how that could be and what it means to have that connection happening between the mountain lion and all these other pieces of the puzzle out there. So, here's where we're going today. I'm going to talk to you briefly about um, the cats in general, just to remind you of some of their aspects of natural history. Then we'll talk about bobcats. And uh, just to start out with, how many of you have seen a bobcat in the wild at some point? Okay, that's good. That's about 20% of you that have seen them. Um, much more common than mountain lions, that's for sure. But they're extremely secretive and they're nocturnal, so they're tough to see. So I'm going to talk to you about a research project we just finished trying to figure out how to count these invisible critters. Then we'll talk about the return of cougars. Five years ago, I talked at this area, and I'm going to even quote myself and tell you how wrong I was about things, and give you some insight as to what has happened over the last uh, five years here. And then uh, I'd like to finish up by, if we have time, talking about uh, dying to meet one of those cougars out there, and what you have to be worried about relative to that when they do finally get a reestablished population here in Wisconsin. Okay, so without further ado, let's jump in and uh, start talking first about the bobcat. But before we do, I have to put that in context. Here in Wisconsin, we have three native cat species. Bobcat far and away is the most common and abundant one. Uh, lynx we have on occasion, but they only come down here sporadically from the north, and that only happens when the snowshoe hare population crashes. They move into Wisconsin, they stay here for a few years, they die out, and they never reproduce here. And cougar, those are the three native cats that we had in Wisconsin, uh, and I'll explain to you that uh, bobcat is the only one really that's on our radar screen on a regular basis here. <clears throat> so, just to remind you some attributes of, of these cat family members versus the dog family members is, 
One of the reasons only 20% of you have seen them is because when they move, they're solitary, unlike wolves that oftentimes will work in packs or coyotes that will howl, make vocalizations. These animals are solitary, they're nocturnal, active at night, they're extremely secretive. Given a choice, they will much rather slink away from you than ever be seen by you. They're also, unlike many of our dog family members in Wisconsin, strictly carnivorous. They only eat meat. Their physiology is built to deal with constant influx of protein. If they don't get it, they don't survive. So they need to eat meat all the time. They're also something we call sexually dimorphic which means there are two different sizes depending on what sex you are. If you're a male, you're big. If you're a female, you're smaller, okay? So there's this sexual dimorphism, much more so than the dog family members where you get these different sizes to them. They're also territorial. Not both sexes, but in all the cats, one sex or the other is territorial. So with bobcats, it's generally the females that are territorial. With mountain lions, it's oftentimes the males that are territorial against uh, one another. One other thing I have to tell you about these animals, all the cats are also, also polygamous, which means that one male will breed with multiple females. The ratio of males to females is one to one. So what it should tell you is if one male gets to breed with multiple females, there's quite a few losers out there on the landscape male-wise. Probably one of the reasons why male body size is bigger than the female body size is because they've got to fight each other in order to get these breeding opportunities out there. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the bobcat first, then we'll move into talking about the, the cougar here. Just a refresher for you, here in Wisconsin, the largest bobcats in North America are found all along these northern tier of states. We have the big guys here. Get down into Texas, really tiny little animals, but up here they're fairly good size. Males somewhere 25 to 35 pounds, females 20 to 25 pounds, although I caught an adult female last year, a fully uh, mature individual with kittens, she weighed 15 pounds, so there are some smaller ones as well. Uh, and then the length also, the males are slightly larger than the females, but not always something that you'd be able to pick out uh, unless you had them side by side with each other. We do hold the record here in Wisconsin for the largest bobcat ever trapped, and that was in Land Lake County back in uh, the end of 2008. And this male bobcat weighed 53 pounds. Huge, gigantic, enormous animal. Would you tuck that into the back of your head, that 53 pound idea? Because it's going to become important when I show you some interesting things we've learned about bobcats in the last few years here. Now, if you look at the distribution of this animal, you'll see that it's throughout most all of the continental United States, down into Mexico, below Mexico City, and then up a little ways into Canada. And then there's this blank spot on the map in the middle there. That blank spot used to be full of bobcats, and now it's being reinvaded. But because of our agricultural practices there and destroying most of the habitat as well as trapping out most of the cats, they were eliminated from that part of the country, but they are making their way back into it. And at least according to um, uh, DNR old records anyway, the northern third of the state has the most common and abundant populations. <coughs> this middle section here may have an occasional bobcat, and then down here where you guys reside are uh, extremely rare animals, uh, at least according to uh, this generalization of distribution out there. Okay, you probably know that bobcats are abundant enough in the state to be harvested. So the DNR has a quota they set every year for how many bobcats can be taken. However, the bobcats can only be harvested north of Highway 64 until this year. This is the first year they've opened the entire state to bobcat harvest. We'll get into that in just a minute, why they decided they might be able to do that, but it has been uh, historically only in the northern third of the state that hunting or trapping has been allowed there. The perfect sized piece of food for a bobcat to eat is a rabbit. So wherever you go throughout North America, rabbit sized food is pretty much what they're taking primarily. However, Wisconsin, there's an interesting twist 
going on. They take a fair amount of deer. Now, there's two theories behind why they do that. They don't do it further south, but we think they might do it up here. One, because deep snow allows those bobcats to be able to get at them and to be successful at killing them. Also, the thought is that up north here, the bobcats are much larger, 53 pound animal. That is a pretty efficient killing machine. So they may be able to handle deer more than they can in other parts of the, uh, their range here in the North American continent. For the last few years, when the DNR um, collects the carcasses from the dead bobcats from the trappers, they have to collect these on a regular basis, and they age them, and they look at reproductive ability of them. We've been gathering their stomachs, and we take them back to the lab, we cut them open, and we look at what the stomach contents are. And what we've discovered is, now most of these animals are being hunted and trapped in the month of December, and we were blown away by the fact that 63% of those stomachs have deer in them, or deer remains in them. That's phenomenal. I mean, nobody expected it to be that high. I have to tell you this, I passed that off as, oh, it's following deer season, right? We've got all these wounded loss, they're just picking off carcasses. And I know they eat carcasses, they'll do it along the side of the road if there's a, a deer that's been hit by a car or something. So I assumed that what was, that's what was going on. However, we don't have any evidence from summertime about what they're eating because we don't harvest bobcats then. It's only usually during that month of December and a little bit into January there as well. Interesting things have been going on with bobcats. They have, throughout the entire Midwest region during the 2000s, expanded their range. And I can't tell you why. Maybe you guys can come up with some good reasons why. But let me show you something. We've been keeping track of their population in the state, not by counting them. We don't know how to do that, or we didn't know how to do that until last year. But what we do do is we go out after a fresh snowfall in the northern counties of the state, and we drive these roads, and we look for how many bobcat tracks go across a length of, of road out there, a 10 mile length of road. That gives us an idea based on those tracks, what's happening to the population. So look at this craziness here, you guys. The end of the 1990s, something allows the population to explode, and then, now, most recently, that population is begin, beginning to decline once again. And again, I don't know what it is. It may be the next question that we try to answer why that's happening, but it's not just here in Wisconsin. It's in Minnesota, it's in Michigan, it's in the whole upper Great Lakes region. So something regionally has turned these guys on and now seems to be turned off again, whatever it may be. But as I alluded to, we never counted bobcats in Wisconsin. We just didn't know how to do it. But a couple of years ago, uh, working in collaboration with the DNR, we tried to come up with a technique to be able to count these guys. So we did this research to try to estimate the bobcat population size. But if they're invisible, how do you go about trying to count them and figure out how many there are over a large geographic area? So what we enlisted in order to do this were scat detecting dogs, those dogs that can smell bobcat scats, and the use of trail cameras. And we pitted them in a competition between each other to find out which one would do better, which one was more effective. So the first phase of our research had us looking at this area right here, the Central Forest <coughs> region, because the DNR had initially indicated that they thought that's where they would like to be able to open a bobcat season south of <coughs> Highway 64. So we said we would do the research, we'd figure out some techniques that could be used uh, across the Upper Great Lakes region for this, and maybe give us an estimate statewide when we were finished with this thing. So, the first year of this study, we did a kind of a pilot study. We went to a bunch of areas in the Central Forest region right here, spanning all the way from Tiffany Bottoms along the Mississippi River, all the way over to Navarino, which is near Shawano. Um, and we did some uh, erection of these four by four camera grids. These are two kilometers by two kilometers here, so it's a little over a mile <coughs> on the side there. We put a camera in each one of these cell blocks 
along a area that a bobcat was likely to move. You'll notice this red stuff are all sorts of roads and trails that go through these different grids. So what we did was we placed, placed cameras in each one of these cells, and we also ran our scat detecting dogs through each one of these cells as well. Let me explain to you a little bit about these scat detecting dogs. Pretty amazing critters. Um, these are not thoroughbred, incredibly well-trained and disciplined animals. These are mutts, okay? <laughs> the only thing that these animals have to do is they have to like to play ball. I, and literally, I mean that. They like to play and chase balls. And the reason you have to get those critters is, let's say this is a, a it is a bobcat scat, quite obviously. The, the dog will come up to that. Now, the dog's been trained on this. We sent these, these dogs that we used came actually out of Washington State. We sent them 30 bobcat scats so they could train their dogs to sniff and just identify bobcats so they don't get messed up with anything else. So what the dog does is the dog goes along sniffing until it gets wind of what it thinks is a bobcat scat. And then it goes over and it sits there, it kind of wags its tail, and it waits for the handler to come to it. The handler comes to it, looks at the scat, and says, looks like bobcat. You tell me it's bobcat. I, I guess it's bobcat. So then the handler takes a ball out of its um, the waistband there and throws the dog and plays with the dog for about two minutes. And that is its reward for finding a bobcat scat. <laughs> now, we had two dogs that were working this area. And this dog was one go and get him kind of dog. It was like, oh, I'm out here, I'm doing that. Oh, I smell, oh, there's something over here. It's just going all over the place doing that. The problem is, if it went for a period of time and didn't smell bobcat scat, it meant it didn't get to play. So, what do you think this dog is going to do? It's going to fake it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, it, it turns out this dog was only correct based on DNA analysis about half the time. The other dog, Chester, Chester just kind of plodded along. Didn't get too far off the trail, kind of looked, then he plowed a little more. He found half the scats that this animal did, but he was 100% right on with every single one he found. So, different personalities, different abilities. Uh, so, they, it was an interesting uh, project to learn how they deal with that stuff. Okay, as I alluded to, we then would take those scats that we collected, bring them into the lab, do a DNA analysis on them, and essentially sequence their DNA so we could get a signature. It's like as if they had written their name on each one of these scats. This is Kevin. Uh, here's another one from Kevin. So what we could do then is we could do what's called mark and recapture, except we didn't have to really mark them or recapture them. Every time we got a scat, we could say, is this a scat that we've had before? And if it's not, if it's a new one, then we can start figuring out actually how many animals there are in a particular area. So we got some very good information from this. Now, simultaneously, we're running these um, infrared uh, cameras. How many of you have trail cameras out there? Okay, excellent, excellent. My next project is to figure out how many are out there in the woods uh, because for a variety of reasons, but I think it's got to be close to a half a million in the Wisconsin woods and plains that are out there that are taking pictures of things, which is a great source of information, as I'll show you when we get the pictures. Um, this particular camera, it's, it's the high end of the cameras, it takes three rapid fire images. The reason for that is if it takes one image and we don't get the identifying characteristics we're looking for, then we've got to wait for the next picture. And I'll show you a, uh, an example of that here in just a moment. Okay, so we did the same thing with the bobcats that we did with the scats, but instead of looking at a DNA signature, we looked for a pelage or coat signature. So you see on this animal's foreleg right there, you see that interesting kind of U-shaped on its side pattern? Another camera in another location, you can see that exact patterning on the leg. The reason we have to take three of them is to make sure that we get that inside leg when they're walking in front of the cameras. Also, if you haven't figured it out yet, there's a real problem here. And that is, if this animal turns around, goes through the other way, 
We don't have any of those identifying characteristics anymore. So what we had to do was we ended up pairing our cameras, one on either side of the trail, so we would get both, both insides of the lane as they went by and allow us to be able to identify them. Now, here's the bottom line. When we threw them a comparison-wise at each other, trail cameras could cover a much larger area than the dogs could. When all was said and done in terms of calculating the cost of doing the SCAD analysis, it came out for that one year to be about $46,000. The trail camera, including all the labor that we had to use to get them out and then collect them again, was only about $18,000. If you multiply this by five years, it turns out that there is no comparison. Once you buy those cameras, you can use them year after year after year. You're just paying for the gas to get out there to do it. So, without a doubt, the very best way to deal with trying to estimate the population over this large, large area that we're looking at. By the way, this area that we are covering is half the size of New Hampshire. So it's a big piece of territory that we're trying to cover and estimate the population for here. So we've got this real cost savings here in terms of being able to do a long-term research project this way. So quite obviously, our pilot study said, don't bother with the dogs, spend all your time and effort working on the camera side of things. Now, I told you that we had to collect these scats to get an individual signature on them. Why waste a good scat? If you've already DNA identified it as being Bobcat, and you're positive for sure it's Bobcat, why not pick it apart so you can figure out what they've been eating during the summertime when the dogs found them. So, here's that winter diet information that I gave you before. With that DNA analysis on it, here's what it looks like in the summertime. And this is really telling. The amount of deer has dropped down to only 30% of the scats having deer in it. However, this is the middle of the summer. There's no deep snow. These guys are killing probably fawns or younger age animals that are vulnerable during the uh, summer months. So bobcats, because there are probably 4,000 in the state of Wisconsin, are probably having a pretty big impact on the deer population, or at least a segment of the deer population that they're having an <coughs> impact on. So we learned a lot just as a, a by the way, based on that research that we had done with a DNA signature on those things. Okay, let me tell you what we did the second year. We ended up put, putting out 315 different cameras located throughout the central forest, okay? If you were nervous about walking in the woods before, should have been nervous two summers ago when we were doing this. Uh, yeah, I used to think it was okay to just kind of go to a tree off the side of the trail if you really had to go. Not anymore. I'm going to look around for trail cameras and make sure it's clear. <coughs> We were able to identify 64 different individuals, and we were actually able to come up with a population estimate for that area that's this half the size of New Hampshire there. And the way we did it, without getting too technical about this, is we had nine different places that we estimated the density of bobcats in. We made a model that said the highest densities are in this kind of habitat, the lowest densities are in this kind of habitat, Let's see if we can put these things together and figure out how many bobcats there should be in that general area. So here are those nine spots that I mentioned that had our trail camera grids in it. And you'll notice that they have different colors of red in there and amounts of red. The more red, the higher the density was and the better the habitat was that we created. So now what we can do is we can get rid of these black boundaries, and we could figure out for this entire area how many bobcats should be in there. And it turned out to be about 362 plus or minus about 100 animals. There are 90 animals. So gives you a good idea of how we went about doing this process in estimating the number of cats in that entire region. We turned that information over to the Department of Natural Resources. Um, the, uh, one of the advisory committees said, well, it looks like we got enough to be able to uh, uh, have a harvest of bobcats in that area. In some way, in somewhere between our recommendation, that Fur Bear Committee's recommendation, and 
the upper echelons of the state um, DNR and the state legislature got turned into a statewide harvest of, of bobcats. So um, here's when you took our model and put it across the entire state, you can see this is a great place. This is the line, Highway 64 right there. That area above it is open to hunting. But if you look down here, you can see that bobcats are much more restricted in their locales. Um, the uh, possibility of having them here in Kettle Moraine uh, area, Central Forest definitely has the largest populations. So. Um, like it or not, uh, the state decided to open all of this area south here. My deepest concerns are this. If you have a small, isolated population down here, hunters and trappers will know that's the only place to go to harvest them, right? It is possible to over-harvest these animals. They're predators. They're what we call case-selected animals. They're not fast in recovery from things. So, my, my worry is that we might end up over-exploiting the, the resource here. Okay, enough on the bobcats. Let's talk about mountain lions for a, a few minutes here. Um, right now, in North America, we've got more mountain lions than we've known about in, a, in historical times. Estimated in the Western United States, anyway, in the U.S., is about 30,000 animals, but again, Cougars are about as hard to count as bobcats are, and in some ways maybe even harder to count. But similar techniques are being developed for them as we use for the, for the bobcats. Wisconsin population? I don't know. Do you get to count them if they're vacationing here? Because right now, we don't have any permanent resident mountain lions in Wisconsin. We may have three that are wandering through currently based on what's happened in the last uh, 12 months here, but there may be none at this particular moment in time. Okay, let's talk just a little bit about how different these guys are from bobcats. Obviously, the long tail is a dead giveaway, but another dead giveaway is the fact that they're much, much larger than bobcats. Um, males can weigh up to 160 pounds, somewhere at 120, 160. Females, again, that sexual size dimorphism, much smaller in size than uh, uh, males are. But these guys are big hunks of animal with some pretty incredible teeth, jaws, and, uh, and claws. And so this sexual side dimorphism also shows up in the size of these critters there. Although unless you have one side by side, male and female, it's really hard to tell what sex they are. Uh, they are also strictly carnivorous, as I mentioned, for all the cat species. And throughout their range, mostly in the western United States, what they're primarily eating are deer. That's 60 to 80% of what they eat are deer. When I was in New Mexico, though, I found them eating elk regularly, found them eating porcupines, but more often than not, when I worked along the Rio Grande River, they were eating beaver. Apparently, when a beaver gets out to chew on some willow by the side of the river, they're right there to get them. So uh, it was very, um, there were several of these cats that were very adept at doing that. So we figured that uh, a male probably eats somewhere between uh, 36 to 38, maybe 40 deer per year in the western United States. Young a female, probably 210 deer uh, per year. So one cat has very little impact on the deer population. If you get hundreds of cats, you might have a different story in there. But as you'll see in a moment, don't think we would ever, ever get that here in uh, Wisconsin. Um, I want to just to give you some home range information for a minute because it figures into what I'm going to talk about next here. In the western United States, there's a big range in the size of male territories, but on average it's about 150 square miles. That's a big piece of territory to wander. We don't know really how big their territories will be here in Wisconsin because every place we've studied them have been in the western United States. And we don't know how with this abundant deer population or the forest structure we've got here, how big their territories will be. That will be something for us to discover. But we've got to get them to stay first before we can get that piece figured out. Um, I don't want you to focus on what this research project was, but I do want you to focus on the size of that dot right there. 
size of that dot is the size of a mountain lion's home range based on the western United States, the male mountain lion. So you see these circles here, that's roughly the size that you could expect a mountain lion's home range to actually be. Okay, when I came here five years ago, this is what it looked like. We had reproducing mountain lions in this entire green area here, Black Hills of South Dakota, up into the Badlands of North Dakota, and we had several cats that had been seen in uh, Wisconsin. And I'll talk about those two cats, or at least one of them, in just, just a moment. But I want you to watch as I change from what the world looked like in 2009 to what it looks like today in 2014. So you can see that what's happened over that time is now we have a population established uh, over here in Nebraska. We've got a whole lot more dots here in Wisconsin as well in the, as the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And uh, we've also got a whole lot of activity going on uh, down in, uh, in the southern areas of Missouri and um, almost down to Arkansas. So lots of activity going on there. Now, if we look at mountain lions in Wisconsin, they were scattered throughout the state prior to settlement uh, of uh, uh, Anglos in this area, but they were never very abundant. Uh, they, as a matter of fact, the historical information we have is there were only 26 verified observations, and as far as being able to count dead bodies, there were only 11 of them that they actually ever got uh, there. So if you take a look at where those spots were, where they were verified, the authentic records and the specimens looked at, you can see that they were fairly well scattered throughout the state. So this is what we knew about them. The other thing we knew about them was the last cougar was killed in Wisconsin in 1908 up in uh, uh, Douglas County up here in the northwestern part of the state. Interesting that number in your head, okay, 1908, because from that point on, there were sporadic observations, the state didn't know what to do with it, they didn't think we had them, but maybe we had them, so they decided to designate them as a special concern species, which actually gave them protection, which meant you couldn't shoot one if you saw one and wanted to prove you really saw one, uh, which was a something somebody more than one person has suggested to me well if i find one i'll shoot it for you uh, that's not what i'm interested in at all so exactly 100 years from when the last mountain lion was killed in wisconsin we found our first physical evidence of mountain lions returning to the state of wisconsin perhaps there had been others before that but this was the first verified, authenticated occurrence. And on the 4th of January, <coughs> very interesting, a gentleman said he saw a mountain lion cut in front of his road down here near Milton and then bound off into the snow along the side of the road. DNR went out there and because the snow was all that grainy stuff to get down here, didn't leave very good tracks at all, so wasn't really definitive. However, just a little ways away, about uh, two weeks later, gentlemen, um, they had another snowfall. He headed out to a barn that was separate from his facilities, an old ramshackle barn that he had some hay in. And as he approached it, he noticed there were these large footprints all around it. And not knowing for sure what it was, he saw the footprints go in to the barn. So he's like, well, I'll check this out. So he walks into the barn and he doesn't see anything. There, there's nothing there. So he decides to climb in the hay mound and see if, you know, just perhaps there might be something up there. And he came face to face with the mountain lion. The mountain lion was terrified. The guy was too, quite obviously. But, but the mountain lion jumped out of the second floor through an opening in the boards and ran off. Now, as soon as the guy cleaned himself up, he went and got the DNR. The DNR came out, they tracked it, and they found a place where apparently the animal had cracked one of the pads on its foot, left just a little bit of blood, but enough blood to be able to get a DNA sample out of it. 
that DNN's A sample confirmed two things. One, yes, it was a cougar, and two, it most closely matched cougars that come from the Black Hills of South Dakota. So all of a sudden, 100 years later, we've got cougars back in the state. It was, for me, this was just, uh, the, it was a, a minute of just pure nirvana for me. It was just uh, an excellent, excellent thing. The unfortunate thing is, and this well, doesn't seem fair to me or the cougar, is that it continued to wander, probably hit Lake Michigan, turned south, but if it had gone north, it would have been just as catastrophic as big a catastrophe as it moved into the Milwaukee area. Instead, it went south into Chicago mm -hmm. and was shot in a pretty developed urban area of Chicago. Um, when they did the necropsy on it, they determined it was a yearly male cougar and the DNA matched between what Wisconsin had and this animal was perfect. So here we go, 100 years of waiting and the animal gets off by the Chicago police. <laughs> it was, it was, they were doing their job. You know, they, they felt that was a necessary thing to protect uh, the people of, uh, of Chicago. Although, if you watch the footage from it, these guys are using sniper guns down alleyways. I mean, anybody or anything could have come out at any moment while they're trying to take this animal out. So I'm not sure how safe it really ultimately was there. I want you to notice two things, uh, because the things that really came home to me about this was, we saw it on the 18th of January. Nobody saw that animal again until the 28th of March when it showed up north of Chicago area. It went for roughly a month and a half, or maybe close to two months, wandering in this, a highly agricultural and settled region without anybody seeing it. If it can exist in those kind of conditions, oh my gosh, how many years could they have been passing through Wisconsin without us ever knowing about it? It's entirely possible. So they've got this ability to stay really low uh, on the radar screen and pass through areas without being seen, even if it's really densely settled areas. Okay. Since then, we have seen a whole lot of mountain lions in the state of Wisconsin, some of which we have DNA evidence for, some of which we just have trail camera photos for. This is our best estimates of how many bobcats we've had every year since that one showed up in 2008. And what you can generally see is a tendency for the numbers to rise. So last year, 2013, we suspect there were at least four or five, although we had many more observations than that. We think they may have been observations of the same animal. So best guesses are that that may be the number. Although the total number that we may have had in Wisconsin may be as high as 18. So, um, and it could be even higher than that. That's a conservative estimate. So they definitely are wandering through this area. I gotta remind you again about the size difference. Here's that bobcat stacked up against these mountain lions. They are big critters, but just because they're big, it doesn't necessarily mean they're any more visible when they're small bobcats. All they gotta do is be secretive, stay put, wait until that vehicle passes or that person passes, and then they can um, make do with what they want to. But oftentimes it's under cover of darkness, so you never see them anyway. Okay, uh, I don't know how well you folks out there can see this, but this is actually all of those locations that I just talked about for the different animals that have passed through Wisconsin. I want you to focus on one in particular here, which is this Green dot, green dot, green dot, green dot, and green dot. Those all turn out to be the exact same animal, all right? That uh, particular animal, the reason we know it's the same animal is, look at this, it's got a radio collar on it. It shows up in the western side of the state, up uh, in Douglas County on a trail camera photograph. We try to track down who radio collared it. So, of course, we go to the Black Hills to see if anybody had um, radio collared animals. And, of course, they had been radio collared. We thought, oh, great, we get the frequency, we'll be able to follow this animal as it moves through Wisconsin. No such luck. They never used this kind of collar on a mountain lion. 
took us a long time to figure out, and actually Adrian Weideman of the DNR finally found out that this collar and collared animal was actually done on the Rosebud Indian Reservation by a biologist there out in the uh, South Dakota and Nebraska uh, uh, area, they're right along the border. So we finally figured it out, but at that point it was too late and the frequencies we couldn't um, use on it because it was no longer transmitting. So here's that same animal as it shows up in the Keweenaw Peninsula there of Michigan. Kind of cool. But remember I showed you those dots about what their territory size was? This is much larger distance than territory, okay? Now you might think that, oh, there wasn't enough food. Oh, come on now. Wisconsin? How many deer do we have in Wisconsin? Okay, they got over a million deer in the state, so they have plenty of food to be able to get. Now, this is the craziest thing. That was in 2010, the last photograph we got of it. Here is opening weekend back in 2012 down in Plainfield. Here he is once again. Where he went for two years, where he lived for two years, we have no idea at all. He had been in Michigan in the Upper Peninsula, but for reasons unknown to us, he came back. And the crazy thing about this particular one, I, I went out there to verify this photograph and talk to the man who had set his trail camera there. He said on opening morning, he had taken his girlfriend and his father out to the deer blinds. And he left his wife at this camera with her gun in the dark while he took his father out to his stand. When he came back, he picked up his girlfriend and took her out to her stand. She, this photograph of this mountain lion was taken about 15 minutes after she vacated that site where she'd been standing for half an hour by herself. So needless to say, they are no longer boyfriend-girlfriend. It's a different relationship now, but, but it, uh, it just goes to show you that they could be out there and you may never know it. Now, the interesting thing is this is right here in Plain, near Plainfield where uh, it showed up. Two weeks later in Stratford, the same cat shows up. So if you put those two places oh. together there, whoa, let's see that for again. Here's where it was, here's where it ended up two weeks later. You can guess what it did. It came here to the Wisconsin River, got across, probably worked its way up, hit the big old plain, and it moved out that direction and followed the river course going that way. So Stevens Point probably had a mountain lion passing right through it. I, I really wish I'd been paying more attention that I got this one and I got this one, but I didn't get anything in between. So trail cameras are really useful for us in terms of figuring out what's going on. This is the most recent verified cougar sighting um, that was found east of Merrill, and that was just uh, on the 1st of September here. I did also just receive um, uh, photographs from what I think also might be a mountain lion, but I'll show you what I have to deal with all the time. Here's a photograph that was sent to me, okay? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Is that a mountain lion? Cool. Yeah, it's a cougar. Well, you know what? I looked at that picture and I thought, I'm not going to call that a cougar. I might call it a bobcat. Might, you know, it's really tough to call it, but now look at the second image in the series. Now, you don't get to see the long tail with yeah. the dark tip on it, but you see an animal that's all the same color with a thick, ropey kind of tail to it coming down. Chances are really good this is a mountain lion, and this came from the Bloomer area quite recently. The end of October was uh, that one. So, um, kind of fun stuff to, to be able to follow by other people's work, their cameras, and see all this stuff. As I mentioned before, these guys are probably all coming from the Black Hills because that's the closest <coughs> reproducing population. Black Hill population is interesting because there are about 250 mountain lions in it and they are saturated. There is no more room for any more mountain lions. So the only way a mountain lion young can get in there is if somebody dies or they end up having to disperse out of that area and leave the region. So, uh, research done out there indicates that 20 to 30 yearlings, that's their second year of life, 
disperse away from that area, going pretty much 360 degrees from the Black Hills region right there. But interesting and characteristic of most mammals, the males are the ones that disperse the furthest. Females stay pretty close to home. The males go a long way off, all right? So we had the longest migration calculated to be from an uh, animal that's marked up here in the Black Hills. 670 miles is nothing compared to the record holder. Uh, and let me tell you about this record holder for just one minute. This was a cougar that was caught on trail cams in Wisconsin back in 2009 all the way through 2010. Do you see the spots on it? Can you see that? Um, if you look carefully, you'll see that marking. That indicates that it's a yearling animal. It's going from being a spotted kitten or cub to being a same color adult. So we knew this animal was a yearling male coming through back in 2010. It got picked up repeatedly on trail cameras and tracks, and we managed to get some scat out of this animal and get a DNA signature on this particular um, critter here. This animal with the DNA signature turned up dead along the side of the road in Connecticut. All right? So it made perhaps a 1,800 mile journey from South Dakota all the way, and we don't know exactly how it got there, whether it went through the UP, whether it went south around Chicago, or whether it backtracked and went around Lake Superior. We don't know how it got there, but we do know that it ended up dead there alongside of the road in Connecticut. Okay, let's put this together with some information that we already have. They love to eat deer. We have lots of deer in Wisconsin, but these guys continue to walk. What do you think they're looking for? Females. Females, absolutely they're looking for females. And what it tells you is Wisconsin doesn't have any female cougars <laughs> yet. And until we get them, we won't have a resident population of mountain lions here. So either somebody's got to import them with Black Hawk helicopters like the DNR is very famous for doing, um, or, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, it's a common fallacy out there. Um, <laughs> Or we have to wait until females step stone their way from South Dakota all the way to Wisconsin, which means you may have to wait until they get to Minnesota and start reproducing in Minnesota. Then when they get saturated, they'll send some female dispersers out into Wisconsin, which will then establish their own population here. <coughs> this Black Hills cougar population is interesting because They've started harvesting them. They started a, a season back in 2005, and now at this point, they're um, really taking quite a few animals. So you can see that 2012 harvest was about 80 animals. My greatest fear was this was gonna turn the spigot off of the flow of cougars into Wisconsin, and we weren't gonna get a new population established. Well, it turns out that if you look at the number that are being seen in Wisconsin versus this harvest, that increase in harvest doesn't seem to have slowed down the number of cougars showing up here in Wisconsin at all. So it bodes well for them possibly moving back into the area and reestablishing themselves out here. Uh, um, I know that I'm running out of time here and I want to leave some time for questions, but real quickly, one of the things that happens oftentimes is people will tell us that they've seen mountain lions and some of them may actually be mountain lions but there are a lot of things that go on that um, make it difficult to actually identify them take a look at this map this is the 2013 reports of cougars look at them there are hundreds of them scattered throughout wisconsin the only ones that have been confirmed <coughs> as mountain lions were these few spots up here. All those rest of those dots that people saw were probably not cougars at all. So what's going on here? Are these people hoaxing? Are they trying to make up stories? Uh, not at all. There's a lot of things that can happen. One of those things is a lot of times they have inadequate biological training to be able to pull out uh, and identify a mountain lion. This, this picture actually ran in the Brilliant paper and it was labeled the Brilliant Cougar. This is a tabby cat sitting in the reeds by the side of the road. Mistaken identity, easy to do. They are cats, but they're just little small cats compared to what mountain lions are. So if you don't have the training, you might not be able to pull that out. 
But a lot of times the problem is this, is you don't have long enough to see it. I don't know about you, but I've seen things running across the road in front of me and thought, what was that? What? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's a cougar. Well, maybe not. And then you go look at the trail and it turns out that it's a dog or a coyote or it's even worse, it's a deer, um, <laughs> which happens. But a lot of times you just don't have the time to see that stuff. Like, what was that? Did you see it? Was it a mountain lion? Yeah, I think it was. No, actually it was a bobcat. It was this bobcat right there coming into a bait pile. All right? So when you don't see it long enough, you really are left wondering, what was that that I saw? I can't, I can't be sure. So a lot of the problems also have to do with not having a good enough scale there to actually tell how big that animal is. <laughs> Remember I showed you that bobcat versus the mountain lion when they're side by side, it's easy to tell. Now here's a mountain lion that showed up down in Stanley and the woman had the presence of mind to come out on her porch in her driveway and take a photograph of it as it moved across the field over here. She had a friend, a neighbor who came and, and followed the tracks of this and said, oh, that cat got to the the fence there, it bounded 15 feet to the fence and then 15 feet onto the other side. It was a 30 foot bound for that mountain lion. Just incredible. So all we needed to do was to have somebody stand out there in the field and then put those two guys together and you realize that that's just a house cat, all right? But without anything to scale it against, it's really hard to make that choice. So if you ever hear the DNR say, well, we can't tell if it's a mountain lion or domestic cat, we need some scale in there, that's what they want to find out. Size-wise, is it really big enough to be a 100-pound animal? All right, and we've seen that go on with this newest one as well to get a photograph of a person in that particular spot. And then of course, I'll finish with the deliberate hoaxes. Man, they have slowed down like crazy since we've had a lot of mountain lions show up in the state here, which I really appreciate. But I, I love to tell a story just because the gentleman who sent me this photograph said it was taken at his deer stand in um, you know, almost on the UP border there in Conover. And he said that he would be glad to take me out and show me where it was. And I emailed him back immediately, said, I would absolutely love to go out with you. We'll be able to prove without a shadow of a doubt that we have mule deer in Wisconsin. Okay? <laughs> this is a mule deer tail right there, okay? That is not a white-tailed deer, and we don't have mule deer in Wisconsin. He never wrote back to me. <laughs> don't know. And then, of course, all of these hoaxes. But the beautiful thing is what I'm getting now are really many more authentic pictures like we saw of that, that overexposed head of a cat there. Absolutely love that that kind of stuff in terms of um, actually getting some good information. All right, I'm going to end with this. Five years ago, I told you that I predict we may have cougars reproducing in Wisconsin within five years. That was overly optimistic. As a matter of fact, it cost me a case of beer with Adrian White. But we have no cats that are permanent residents in Wisconsin yet that we know of. Uh, but they will be here someday. And whether or not their numbers will ever be high enough to even be anything to be concerned about, uh, I kind of doubt it. We've had um, no mortalities in anywhere in the United States due to mountain lions since 2008 was the last one that we had, and that was a very strange circumstance. Uh, uh, behind that. So the chances of them being a significant uh, mortality factor are negligible. You know what you got to be afraid of? Black bears. <laughs> a person and a half is killed. A person and a half? I don't know how that works out, but you can figure out the math on that. A person and a half dies every year from being killed by black bears in the wild. So you're much more likely to die in the jaws of a black bear, which is incrementally uh, improbable. And your chances of dying in the jaws of a mountain lion is just about zero. It's 
human gets killed every year by a mountain lion. So that takes a decade before you can get one individual dead. So with that, I, I throw it open to you folks. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to try to answer it. I've been cut out a lot of <coughs> talking here. What's that? A lot of flies. Oh, yeah. Great. Excellent. Yeah. That's one of the things that happens when you have to finish ahead of your scheduled end here. Um, and here's the part that I did want to talk about in terms of butterflies. So what are those butterflies and the cougars? Well, this is some research that was done in Utah. But what they discovered in Utah was that in areas where mountain lions had been removed from, had been trapped out or hunted, Deer populations exploded after the cougars became rare or disappeared in those regions because the only thing holding these guys in check were the mountain lions. Now that mountain lions weren't eating them, they were consuming all the vegetation around in these what we call riparian zones. So in the absence of the mountain lion, what would happen is all this great vegetation right here would get mowed down by the um, deer. And you'd end up with a river that looked like this as opposed to looking like that. So all of a sudden you begin to understand why in an environment like this you'd have more amphibians, more butterflies, more of the other species that we talked about, the lizards as well, occurring within these zones that have mountain lions in them. Folks, it's what we call a trophic cascade. And from the top, these predators are controlling everything that happens down the trophic pyramid from there. You've all heard about the wolves in Yellowstone. We can see an exact replicate of that happening here with mountain lions on the landscape. Mountain lions used to make up a natural part of the ecosystem <coughs> here in Wisconsin. I only hope we get an opportunity to allow them to reestablish themselves here and to play that ecological role that they played for thousands of years before we ever got on the scene here. And with that, I will entertain other questions now. So thanks for calling me to get, get back to the ending here. Any questions? I have one. Yes, so, please. Uh, it doesn't appear that these bobcats are much of a danger to humans, and I haven't seen anything from here to livestock even. What they do do is reduce the, what many of us think is an overpopulation of deer. You had a flash of a little figure about deer car collisions on there. Uh, why are we, and I appreciate using carvers, but why are we killing these magnificent creatures? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I guess I have to put it in context of there is a, uh, a segment of Wisconsin's society that traditionally have uh, hunted and trapped, and a part of that is having access to that resource. We can harvest them and not eliminate them. Now, whether you think it's an appropriate thing to do or not, that's, it is a value judgment, but the state of Wisconsin has decided that harvesting bobcats is something that if we restrict it and we do it carefully, can be done without driving the population down. So I would only concur 100% with you, they are magnificent animals, absolutely. Very smart, very intelligent. Most predators are very intelligent. They have larger brains relative to their bodies than other species do because of that ability to learn and how to be able to hunt and things like that. So yeah, I, I can see why that might be a concern for you. Any other questions? I, I, yeah. Okay, one, one second, I'm gonna get, sure. um, yeah, go ahead. I just had one comment. A friend of mine saw a bobcat, last week, little town of Boulder and Bobcat, two kittens, one of my old best of kitchen mice. Oh, no kidding. That is outstanding. Rare, rare to see them during the middle of the day. That's yeah, really, really nice. in that. Night. From bow hunting, after dusk, turn the corners, headlights hit this, that, and they're over me, got closer, and where is this? And I don't even recognize what they were. Um, I don't know if you, if you saw that map that we made of where bobcats are predicted to be in the state. You might have noticed that the whole Cooley country had nothing in it. 
because the model we built was based on central Wisconsin. I think that Cooley country is crawling with cats uh, in areas, and I would love the DNR to hire us to take a look at this region and find out what kind of cat population actually exists here. This is beautiful form, especially with the open areas up on top and the forested regions in between that. Uh, that's nirvana for cats. It's just a, a great kind of environment to, to be set up in. And then, and then I'll get to you. Uh, presumably in the future we'll have some verified reproduction. And I'm curious to know what type of methods uh, hopefully people will be employing to monitor. Yeah. Um, if you can compare that with the bobcat or yeah. whatever they do with the panthers. The Qu question was how we're going to monitor that. Yeah. Right now, the state is working on a statewide trail camera program to keep track of wolves, to keep track of fishers, to keep track of bobcat, a lot of the carnivores that we have. If we end up getting reproduction here, I'll show you what we're going to do with that. We are going to put on these critters. Forgive me for just one moment here while I get to it. We're going to put these collars on them. These are pretty heavy duty radio transmitting collars, except they do one thing quite different. They calculate where the animal is with a GPS installed on it, and then they send that location up to a satellite, which bounces it back down to our laptops. So we can know at any moment in time where that animal is. So I think we're gonna end up using those to figure out where these critters are. If I can diverge for just a half a second here. I used these collars when I was in New Mexico and I was following a very large male, 160 pound um, critter as he wandered, this is Albuquerque right here, wandered just north of it down the Rio Grande River up and down, woke up one morning at 6 a.m. and I looked at the five o'clock location for this critter and it's right there in the middle of the street in suburban Albuquerque. <laughs> Nobody reported it. I am sure they lost dogs and cats in the neighborhood and they didn't know why. But I think we have lived for years in the western United States with mountain lions making these forays in and out of urban areas. And with these GPS collars, you can find out a lot of information like that and realize they don't really pose a threat at all. Nobody even saw it, let alone um, was concerned about it. So, a um, little long-winded answer to your question there. You had a question? Yeah, two questions. First of all, do bobcats hunt from above like um, the mountains do? They don't generally do that. Most of what bobcats do is they stalk and use the dense cover along the ground to be able to get at their, their food resources. Second question would be, um, I know that coyotes don't inhabit the same area as the wolves do because they're in um, competition with each other. Where does the mountain lion or the, or the bobcat stand in relation to coyotes and wolves? Little less uh, understood, but what we've noticed in the western United States is when wolves are taken out, coyote numbers go up, bobcat numbers plummet. Okay? Mm. So, indirectly, when you've got wolves there, it actually makes the habitat more inhabitable by bobcats. The, we still need a lot of research done in that area to find out for sure how that works, but that's what observation tells us. So, it's an interesting double connection there that goes on. Okay. Real quick, does a bobcat sneeze sound human? There's one for you. I got a, something, something sneezed <laughs> behind me one night. And I wasn't I'll take a pass on that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, uh, only late at night at a bar. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Think about this. Look at how unpopular wolves are in the state of Wisconsin. If you start talking about bringing in a potentially deadly 
carnivore, it's a really hard sell. We're going to have to wait, I think, until they naturally get here. Um, I didn't get to show you the kittens that I got a chance to work with when I was in New Mexico, but I got to work with several dens of mountain lions. I can tell you, I thought for a brief second, boy, it'd be really easy to get these guys into hand luggage and take them back to the restaurant. But that would just start a firestorm of rumors that would, would end up with Blackhawks coming in at night and you know, all that kind of stuff. So, good, good point, but politically, I think not viable. Um, yeah. The Cougars. Is there a vocalization, like a growl? Could that, is that a possibility? Yeah, is, uh, the question was, is, is a growl a possibility for a vocalization with mountain lions? Yes, it is, but it's pretty infrequent. Um, the only time I heard them vocalize when I was working with them was when I uh, was capturing them. That's the only time that I would hear any vocalization coming out. And it would, a lot of times, just be a, a hissing threat that they would make to me when uh, they were restrained at that point by uh, cables on their I had something growl behind me 20 years ago, turkey hunting ah. in Mississippi. And the breeze was just gentle. And this was real early in the morning. And I said, am I going to have to shoot my way out of here? <laughs> <laughs> real quiet. I never saw a thing. I talked to old Kenny Marshall, who was woodsman. He says, if it was a bear, he says it would have ran and crashed through the brush. If yeah. it was a farm dog, he says you would have seen it. Off a couple hundred yards and buff or something. He says, I think it was a calf. And he'd seen a calf here in this, in this country one time. Yeah, could, could have been a bobcat. He's just oh, yeah. describing what the, what the sound <laughs> might have been that, that he heard behind him. But yeah, could have been. So, any other questions? Yeah. You said they hiss. They can hiss. Do they ever cry? Um, I've got some footage of a female with two kittens traveling with her. And you can hear her mewing a little bit to the kittens to get them to come along, and especially when she was out of the picture and one of the kittens had stayed behind and was playing around at this water tank. So they do mew like that. Um, not sure I would describe it as a cry mm -hmm. exactly, but, um, but I would, yeah. And it doesn't carry very far. That's a very soft sound to it. However, when the females get ready to breed and want to be bred, you can hear that from miles away. Uh, it's advertising the males. And if you've ever heard of a female cat in heat, it is very similar to that. It's like... <coughs> so uh, you, you get the message. It uh, carries it pretty clearly. Any other questions? Yeah. Do bobcats do that too? That is bobcats. I don't know that mountain lions do it. I, I spent three days living in the Denver Zoo when I wanted to experiment with these radio collars on bobcats when I was doing my PhD work. So I got to live in the cat house. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's hard to explain to my wife, but. Um, <laughs> But while I was there, she came into estrus, and I, I got some great recordings of the sounds that she as a female bobcat made. Never had a chance to stay in the mountain lion cat house. Maybe, maybe someday, later down the line, that'll be my, uh, my pinnacle of research heights here. I have a question. Yes? You, you kind of covered it, but uh, I'm going back to the 1960s now, around this area. I did liquor, but I babysat around this area, and we used to hear at night, it would sound like a woman screaming, and they used to say it was a link, uh, and, and this is back in the 1960s, so uh -huh. do they sound like a woman screaming? I was thinking maybe it is a female when it's in heat or something. Yeah. Have you um, heard of that? There are a number of, of wildlife species that sound like a woman screaming, including um, rabbits. Mm -hmm. Um, when they're being killed, sound just like a, a woman. And hares in particular, oh my gosh. Yeah, we, we used to catch these things and while we would be pulling them out of the cages, they would start screaming like a woman who was, yeah, being assaulted. So it could have been a lot of different things, so I can't tell you for sure. Interesting. Yeah. Cougars do sound like that. <coughs> and, uh, when I was back in 1960, I saw one on the farm where we were at, and 
the eyes were this far apart and they were that big around. It was at night. Uh huh. And the tracks and the snow were coming out in the morning. The tracks and the snow were six foot from the front to the back. Wow. Entirely possible. This gentleman just described seeing something in the 1960s and hearing a, a scream and then saw tracks that looked like a mountain lion and it could very well be a mountain lion. Like I said, they've been able to float beneath our radar screen yeah. and they're right in our backyard sometimes. So I've heard a lot of mountain out west. I am used to hunting. Okay, yeah, so hunting the mountain west. Um, one last question. I was just going to mention. For a number of years. Interesting about railroads because when I showed you that picture of the longest dispersing mountain lion from the Black Hills down to Oklahoma, they found that dead along railroad track. Apparently, and that's happened several other places too, mountain lions like to use those as corridors and they get whacked by trains when they're coming through. Uh, they have no experience with it, so it doesn't surprise me at all. So with that, thanks all for uh, coming here.